was listening to a radio uh, thing called uh, Freakonomics, it's an online podcast, and it looks at the weird ways that economics work around the world. And if you sound that, it sounds rather dorktacular. Well, yeah, it is. It is pretty dorktacular. But uh, I was listening to it describe houses in Japan. And if you think of houses in Japan, you have this, like, at least for me, I have this image of these, like, square wooden, like, wooden shingles, stuff like that, or a classic Asian building. And uh, the reality is far different. You see, Japan has some of the weirdest houses built in the world. I found four of them and put them on the front of your bulletin. I want you to look at those. And those are not like, I went searching for the weirdest. Those are the ones I just thought were fun. Like, I found pages and pages and pages of weird houses in Japan. My favorite of those is the one with the pink that looks like it's built cockeyed, built on the, I think that's awesome. Why do they build such funky houses? Like, if you saw a house like that around here, our houses are boring compared to Japan. Why do they build such interesting houses? Well, the half-life of houses in Japan is 30 years. Think about what that means. Right? Half of houses are older than 30, half of houses in Japan are younger than 30 years. The half-life in America is 100 years. Like, my house is 100 and something years old, and that, that's like, that's right there. That's half-life of houses in America. And we live in the Midwest, so, like, there are far older houses on the coasts, or on the East Coast. And if you find a house that's 30 years old, that's like almost new construction around here. Whereas 30 years old, a 30-year-old house in Japan is going to get knocked down. It probably is, is about to get knocked down. So why do you knock down a house? Anyone, I've never bought a new car, but I'm told it feels kind of weird to drive a new car off the lot, because what happens the second you drive the car off the lot? Poof! There went 30% of its value. It's the most expensive two feet of driving you will ever do, right? That's how it works with homes in Japan. Houses depreciate in value in Japan. And so when you sell your house in Japan, you don't sell your house. You sell the land it is built on, and then they knock the house down. That's how it works. That is just the culture. And so it's an interesting thing because you hear about like uh, Asians having a very high savings rate. Well, of course, because they don't, we have a, one of the ways that most people save is they pay their mortgage, and then you pay your mortgage in America, and then you have an asset that increases in value. In Japan, you pay your mortgage, and it's like paying, making car payments. You kind of wince every time you do it, because you know it's just pff, gone. So this is, a, this is an interesting thing. Like, and it's a horrible drag on the economy. The middle class can't build up wealth. It's a great place for architects to play, but, uh, it's a, to us, it sounds crazy. What started this was World War II. As you might remember or know, World War II, Japan had a, fair, a few very bad days. And a lot of their housing stock went up in flames, literally. Poof, gone. And so they had to build, flame, build new houses right away. And so they built houses for all everyone to live in right after the war. But if you build fast, what you do is you build cheap. And these cheap houses are built on Japan. And Japan happens to have a lot of earthquakes. And so if you're living in a cheap house in the middle of a land that has lots of earthquakes, when your kids grow up, they build new houses because you want to be safer. Building codes improve, you want to be safer, the economy is starting to flourish. And so you build new houses afterwards. You knock down the old house and you build a new house because it's safer. And thus starts this cycle. And we do it today with our cars, right? Why do you buy a new car? Because safety ratings increase, don't you, right? You want a new car for your kid, you're going to buy, what type of car are you going to buy? You're going to buy a 1965 Mustang? Or you're going to buy a brand new Toyota or Subaru or something very boring and very safe, right? It's the same in inclination. You buy something safe. And so old old homes were seen as less valuable, knocked down and replaced with newer homes. And so they only last 30 years, because that's how long uh, you sort of raise your kids, you, 30 years, then, then you, that, that's it, you're done with your house. And so uh, that's why homes become disposable in Japan. It's a very weird situation to us, but over there, that's how it works. Let me tell you another weird situation that we encounter at times. 
I will bring these back together down the road. Just roll with me for right now. The Old Testament gives explicit guidance on how to own slaves. Kind of weird to talk about, but it's there. If, you're, if you are a slave in the times of the Old Testament, there are exacting uh, descriptions of how that is to be handled. If you are a member, Deuteronomy 15, if you are a member of the community and uh, is sold to you and works for six years, in the seventh year you shall set them free, and when you set them free, you shall give them liberally out of their, your flock, the flock that they work to grow. Okay, so every seventh year, if, if you have someone sold to you, then you need to let them go. Um, Leviticus 25 talks about if any of you who are dependent become so impoverished that you sell yourself, uh, you shall not make them slave into perpetuity. They shall be served until the year of the Jubilee, which is every 50th year. And so every 50th year, all slaves are freed in, in, in Israel. Now, if you are a foreigner who uh, you are a foreigner and you are a slave, then you're stuck your entire life. It didn't happen very often. Israel very rarely went conquering. Uh, if you are a foreigner in Israel and you buy a Hebrew slave, any of your family, uh, this is in Leviticus 25, can buy your freedom based upon the number of years to the Jubilee. And, and so let's say that... Um, Someone, one of you does something stupid and you have to sell yourself in slavery to pay off your debt, your brother could show up and say, it's, you, you went into slavery at 20 years to the Jubilee and paid 10 grand? Well, now it's 10 years to the Jubilee. I'll give you five grand to set that person free. And, and so there's this me mechanism in place so you, your slave, you could be freed if you paid off in relationship to how many years you had left. To serve. If you were a thief and you got caught, you'd be a slave uh, to pay off your debt. And there are protections for women. If uh, a person, if, if you looked at a woman and she had been conquered and, and become a slave, you could make her your wife. But if you, you couldn't ever divorce her, and if you did, you had to set her free with a goodly chunk of property because you, you didn't... Uh, you had to treat her right, Deuteronomy 21. And everyone gets the Sabbath off, seventh day, everyone gets the Sabbath off. So there, there's like a very brief thumbnail sketch of this weird thing that there is slavery in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Jesus never directly addresses slavery. He says things like, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all might believe him and have eternal life. And so there, there's this promise that Jesus makes to all people. But he makes this promise into a time into which slavery is still happening. And as the early church grapples with how do they live in the light of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, they've got to figure out how do we handle slavery. This is a pressing issue. And so... Paul gives them some directions. He gives house codes. We heard in Colossians talking about uh, slaves serve your master. And masters, you, serve, you make sure to respect your slaves for you all have the same master. He says it in Colossians. He says it in Ephesians. Right? St don't threaten your slaves for know that both of you have the same master in heaven and with him there is no partiality. Uh, and then Paul, having given this instruction about how to handle slavery, says multiple times, in Christ there is neither male nor female, slave nor Greek, uh, slave or free, Jew or Greek, right? The, the, that gender and, and economic status and nationality uh, are secondary to in Christ there is neither male nor female, uh, Jew, slave nor free, Jew nor Greek. And he says this in Galatians, in Colossians, he says it in Romans, he says it all the time. It's one of those things that it just rolls off his tongue because he says it so often, or, or rolls off his pen, so to speak. And so, this is the interesting tension we have in the New Testament. We have Paul's advice on how to treat slaves, and Paul saying repeatedly, but we're all the same children of God. There's an equality there. Kind of weird. So we have these two weird situations. In Japan, houses depreciate in value. And in the Bible, we have slavery described and condoned. So what do we do about this? It would seem like we would know a better way of life. In Japan, just take care of your houses. In slavery, why, why well, shouldn't live with slavery, right? Let's talk about what it takes to change a weird situation. Let's say you wanted to make a killing on the Japanese uh, housing market, right? You had some money burning a hole in your pocket, and you want to go make some money on Japanese housing. And you went in, you were going to buy up all these 30-year-old houses, and you were going to maintain them so you could have them start increasing in value. 
Here's a problem. There aren't handymen. Like, if, if there's something that breaks around here, like, two weeks ago, we had a problem with the air conditioners. I had an air conditioning person in here like that. I called, they were here 24 hours. In Japan, there aren't air conditioner people to call like that. Right? Because people are not repairing their houses like that. And so, the logic becomes... If your child goes to college, let's say you're living in a three-bedroom, two-bath setup, and your child goes to college and the bath that they grew up using broke, do you fix it? No. Because your child went off to college. You have a bathroom, it works, and you're going to knock down the house when it's sold in a few years. So why do you repair it? And so A, people don't think to repair it, which means B, there isn't a market for handymen to be around contractors to repair houses. The only people who are doing contractor type work are doing new construction. And you saw the type of houses they're building. That would take a while. And so all the contractors doing new construction and there aren't local hardware stores like we have. Like there would be places to sell building supplies in Japan. But if you think about like you walk into a Home Depot, the whole fleet of people who are are waiting there for you to say what I say, which is to hold up a picture and say, that's broke, where do I buy another one? Right? That doesn't exist in Japan. There's not a market for it. And so if you wanted to buy a bunch of houses in Japan and fix them up, what would you have to do? You'd have to get a group of people and buy a bunch of houses together and form a community association, form a neighborhood, and you'd have to agree. Like, I'll learn how to do drywall work. I'll learn how to do plumbing work. I'll learn how to do the ordering so we can order the parts from overseas because we can't get them otherwise, right? You would have to develop a community of people who are willing to do the work that everyone else is not doing. And what would it look like when you went to your job on Monday and people talked about, what did you do this weekend? And you'd say, well, I fixed up my kid's bathroom. And what would people say? Why did you do that? Your kid went to college. Why do you bother? You're just going to knock down your house in a few years and you sell it, and then you'd say, well, I'm going to keep my house. And they'd look at you like you had gone plum stupid. Right? Why are you doing that? To change the Japanese housing market, which really, don't try. It just, whoo, that'd be horrible. It would take a lot of work, right? If you were going to really change that, it would take a group of people committing to live differently, to build houses that are designed to live last, to, to last more than 30 years, and to learn the skills and arts and trades necessary to maintain a house. And to do it all the while the neighbors looking at you and saying, you're weird. That's what it would take. So, what about slavery in the Bible among the followers of God? There's all this guidance. There's, there's the way things are done, right? This is just how things happen. Slaves exist, and that's just the way it is. Just like houses exist in Japan, and you just knock them down after 30 years. Like, that's just the way it is. And yet, in this church, we start hearing again and again that in Christ there is neither male nor female, Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, that all are one and children of God in Jesus Christ. And so what happens? Like, how do we start to understand that the church is the place that is called to, to live in the kingdom of God, and even if the, the Roman Empire condones slavery? Well, how would Paul do? That's what Philemon is doing. Philemon is doing something fascinating, because what Philemon shows us is how Paul starts to move the church in a new direction. Because what, what does Paul do? Paul says to a leader in the church, you really should let your slave free. He's, say, he's saying something that they had not thought about before. And, and it happens, right? The fact that we still have the letter proves that the slave was freed. And so Philemon shows up to church with Onesimus. Onesimus sits in the pew next to him and everyone goes, huh? And then he has to explain himself. You ever have someone show up to church and you think, well, they've done something crazy, right? And, and that's what happens. Philemon shows up to church and everyone's looking at him and saying, man, Philemon, what happened? What? Huh? Right? And so Philemon has to explain. Paul talked to me about this and Paul was right and I changed my mind and I don't believe we should have slavery. And there were people in that church who owned slaves. And so that church has to grapple with should we have slaves? How does that work? Is that something we should be involved with? Right? And then the church, the church starts to do it. The church starts to free its slaves. 
And what do you think the neighbors think about that? If an entire church, a group of 40, 50, 60 people, in that time, they all free their slaves, what do you think their neighbors said to them? Are you crazy? Why would you do that? You put a lot of money into those slaves. You bought, those were expensive. Why, how could you free them? Right? But that's what the church does. To be a community gathered to say, this is how we're going to live. And other people are going to look at it and say it's weird, but we're doing it because we follow Jesus. <coughs> what we see in this is that when people gather to follow Jesus and Jesus first, there are going to be times when the rest of the world looks at the church and says, you're weird, right? And the only thing the church can say is, and we follow Jesus. That's why we do it, right? We follow Jesus, you think we're weird. We're being saved. I think when Paul talks about being a fool for Christ, this, this letter comes to mind for me. Last week we looked at Philemon up close. We looked at it as an individual little saga between Philemon, Onesimus, and Paul. This week we look at it, how it shapes the nature of what it means to be church. How does the church live in tension with the surrounding community? Because the church is not the world out there. We follow Jesus towards the kingdom of God. And that is not what is out there. We are following Jesus towards heaven. And so what that means is there are going to be points of tension between how the church lives and the world around us. And it's the things that we have to figure out as a church. How are we going to live? How are we going to hold fathers accountable to stay and raise children in a culture where divorce is ever more prevalent and one-parent households seem normal? We say, no, that is not normal. Children need both parents, right? And we will do what it takes to support families and give them the parenting and the grandparenting if necessary to make that happen. How do we do things like when we talk, you know the word that's not in scripture? Illegal aliens doesn't exist. How do we become the community that says all people are children of God, period? That's what it is, right? When it comes to talking about immigration. How do we respect and honor women as equal in marriage and in stature? How do we rebuke a culture that sees, gr sees greed as good and condones inequality to the point that the fastest growing group in poverty today, you want to guess who it is? It's the elderly. The elderly are the fastest growing group in poverty. We should live in tension to that. We need to take care of people who are otherwise going to be in poverty. How do we become the, the church that learns to argue about politics in a way that respects others instead of the current no-holds-barred, compromises-a-bad-word approach? And to hold all of these stances with the same nuanced grace and understanding that Paul exhibits in the letter. Because to be different is not enough. It is to be different and to do so gracefully with the grace that Paul exhibits to Philemon. If you have ever heard a sermon, read the Bible, prayed, come to a realization and thought, if I take that seriously, people are going to think I'm weird, but all I can say to you is, yep. Eh? That's what it means to be church. We can do that. We are empowered by the Spirit to live as the people who follow Jesus Christ, to be the kingdom, inbreaking kingdom of God, which is different than the nature and the nation and the culture in which we live. Just as Philemon received this letter and it called him to do something new, so can we. As we gather each week as God's people receiving God's grace, we are being transformed, transformed so that we might be weird. Weird to the world, which is another way of saying being more like Christ. Amen.